Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us the privilege of life <clears throat> and the liberty of the spirit and the gift sometimes to speak truth in the midst of lies. We recognize that whenever you call anybody, men or women, any kind of people, you take this risk of putting treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of you and not of us. So if you would, hide us behind the cross, cover us in your blood, fill us with your spirit. <clears throat> and somehow let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and blessed Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Ms. Fletcher, I um, am thankful to be anywhere even close, Dean, to the Beecher Lectures. <laughs> At least I can say I was around. <laughs> and to um, be here, thank you, Dean, and to all of the great team here at Yale all of the students here and all of the great witnesses. Um, Braxton was mighty kind. But the truth of the matter is, I got contrariness from my father, who when I was born <clears throat> in Indianapolis, Indiana, two days after the March on Washington, uh, my mother and father said that <clears throat> she went into labor on the 28th. But I said, wait a minute, let's see what happens at this march. And, uh, and then I decided to come on on the 30th. And when they filled out my birth certificate, they um, wanted to put Negro. It was a common phrase at that time. And my father uh, resisted. It was very contrary to that. And he said, um, I want Negro, white, Caucasian, and Native American. And they said, we can't do that. He said, why can't you do it? It's true. And there was this whole struggle. Um, but he didn't back up. And they put Negro uh, with Caucasian and uh, Native, Native descent. <laughs> Some, not, not descent. Um, uh, Negro with Caucasian. And yeah. And um, he told me later on, when I asked him about it, that you have to own all that God makes you and not some of it. And that society is often trying to get you to deny who you are. And once you deny who you are, you have also denied whose you are. And once you deny who you are and whose you are, then you don't know who you are and then other people get to control you and make you who they want you to be. This morning I want to try for, uh, this lecture <clears throat> to talk about wisdom from Ezekiel for working on a third reconstruction in this moment. And when I was in seminary, <clears throat> we learned, and I think it's still taught around here, that you cannot e exegete <clears throat> a biblical text without understanding its zits and laban. I learned that from a Presbyterian New Testament scholar uh, down at Duke, zits and laban. Uh, the context in which the biblical authors received a word or an inspiration or an insight from the Lord. So before I talk about Ezekiel this morning, <clears throat> I want to attend a little bit to Ezekiel's zits and laban. And um, in some ways, it's going to sound eerily familiar. Ezekiel is a tough, frank, penetrating book to read. Ezekiel was a priest whom God called to be a prophet. Uh, he operated in both. 
and he had to prophesy to a nation split into different camps <clears throat> Israel Judah both sides were suffering from idol worship self-centeredness social injustice against the vulnerable in their country and so much of the religious activity served to protect the unrighteousness and to protect unrighteous leadership so much of the religious activity became the chaplain of unrighteousness and the cover up for all sorts of injustice it's so bad that in the 22nd chapter of Ezekiel which we will come to hear about a little bit more later but Ezekiel talks about the bloody city not a city that has some blood on it or some blood in it but a city that is bloody pluralist plural bloody will you judge the bloody city and with this double call priest and prophet God told Ezekiel to pronounce judgment upon the bloody city guilty of many sins chief among them injustice towards the poor and the vulnerable leading to all kinds of death and violence Ezekiel's book is quite frank policy murder and death was being covered up by the religious leaders they were being trained more how to cover up sin than to challenge it this is a Zitzin Laban in which Ezekiel was called to be a prophet from 30 years of ministry I've learned also that the Zitzin Laban also shapes the preached word I think it was um, Professor Long, um, that professor of religion, who once asked the question, if you're on the slave ship in the bottom of the slave ship, and if you're on the slave ship driving the slave ship, and you pray, to which God do you pray? And what is the content and context of your prayers? because perhaps the setting from which you pray has so much to do with how you see and understand God. The Zitz and Laban shapes the preach word. You can't hear what the Lord is saying to us today unless you take time to understand clearly the world in which we're living in. One of the things that has caught my attention over the years is that when you get to the book of Acts, there's been great dialogue for instance about speaking in tongues but I've always been hung up on it says and they heard how do we hear Isaiah 50 says our first move ought not to be to speak but it ought to be to hear it doesn't it say open my ears each morning Lord give me an instructed tongue that I might know how to speak to those who are in distress. We need to take a few minutes to look honestly at where we are today as a society and I can't tell you how many times I have laid this out and folks say but that's not happy. <laughs> and you can't organize folk talking about this so I say to them so what you want us to do is organize people based on a lie. And they say, but, but there are some good things. What I'm going to talk about does not eliminate that there are some good things. <clears throat> but a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> but it doesn't mean you don't fix the clock. <laughs> so let's take a moment to assess what we've learned from the past 2.5 years of this pandemic or what what should I say has been has been exposed clearer it was already there one of the things we have learned is that we have a system that when faced with a crisis can spend money that makes corporation profits soar while leaving so-called essential workers vulnerable to a deadly disease 
and poor and low co income people subject to eviction and displacement. We've learned that. And we've learned that we didn't learn not to do this 100 years ago because the mistakes we're making today are the same ones that Woodrow Wilson made in the 19, early, uh, 19, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 20 when he lied about a pandemic, when he distorted the truth and tried to blame it on Spanish people, when he cost America 600 and some odd thousand lives that did not necessarily have to die. And when he did that, and then what followed those actions was the Great Depression. And in the middle of all of that, <clears throat> he also promoted racism to the point that Red Summer happened right in the midst of the pandemic. And that's when so much blood was shed of black men coming back from World War I because they were decided to be, by some people, a threat and needed to be put back in their place. Here's a base level reality, Dean, about our current context. A current context that you and professors here and others have to <clears throat> attempt to instruct students. Just in America, 140 million poor and low wealth people in this nation. 43% of all Americans are poor, low wealth, or low wage. And it went up to as high as 150 million during COVID, which means during COVID, we, we got close to being at 50% of this nation being poor or low wealth. But we were already at 50% of our children before COVID. So 52% of all of our children <clears throat> live in poverty and low wealth. Now, the number did drop to 112 million in 2021, but it was because of temporary policies that we have now ended. How cruel is that? To lift folk up for a moment and then drop them right back down. 51% of our children under the age of 18, 32 million. 40% of adults between 18 and 64, 81 million. 42% of our elders over the age of 65, 20 million. 33.9% of white people, 67.1 million. 60.3% 60 of black people, 25.9 million black people. 65% of Latinx people, 37 million. 41% of Asian people, 7.6 million, and over 38% of indigenous people are poor and or low wealth. One third of all poor and low wealth people live in the South. And the Southern states and the Southern politicians are the ones that are most against policies that would alleviate the problem. 400 people, as we sit in this room this morning, make an average of $97,000 an hour. And three people had more money than the bottom 50% of all Americans combined. While people today in the 21st century get, get arrested for simply standing for a living wage a living wage of $15 an hour, which was called for at the March on Washington in 1963 when, the, when they, want, they asked for a $2 minimum wage, which indexed by inflation and all of that would be 15, actually should be 19 today. 150 million Americans control only 2% of the wealth. 12% of U.S. households or 13.8 million households face unaffordable water bills. And four million families get up every morning with children and they can buy unleaded gas, but they can't buy unleaded water. During COVID, 
billionaires made two trillion dollars. Six to eight percent of all the COVID relief money went to corporations. Sixty eight percent, excuse me. Over one point three trillion dollars. You know, we're always being told we don't have the money, we've got to raise taxes, but somehow one point three trillion dollars went straight from the Treasury Department, didn't even come through Congress. How do you preach in a society like this? Poor low-wage workers were the first to be called essential. And why did we change that word? Because prior to COVID, they were service workers. But when COVID hit, they became essential workers which by that slight policy designation meant they had to go to work. They had to go to work even without living wages, even without paid family leave, even without insurance, even without protection against evictions. In fact, the, the formula we came up for ev evictions was, we will forgive you for four months, but in the fourth month, you have to pay back the four months that you couldn't pay. How do you preach in a time like this? Poor low-wage workers were the first to get sick, the first to go to the hospital, the first to die. Poor low-wage people were three to five times higher in the death rate with COVID. COVID didn't kill us all. COVID didn't discriminate, but we did. And we allowed through policy COVID to be unleashed in poor and low wealth communities. My daughter's a public health scholar from, uh, graduated from Bennett College in Harvard. My son is a uh, environmental physicist and lawyer, graduated from North Carolina Central University and UNC. And all the while they've been screaming, Daddy, none of this had to happen. Over a million people, some say as high as, as, as five, 60% of those that died didn't have to die. How do you preach in that? We haven't raised the minimum wage for 12 years, 725 an hour. There's not a county in this country anywhere where a person working minimum wage job can afford a basic two bedroom apartment. And by the way, when we go to the restaurants this evening and don't hear the people there only make $2.15 an hour. Somebody says plus tips, yeah, well, that depends. And you should know that restaurant workers, because their wages are so low by policy, policy says their wages can only be that high. Many of them could not, could not qualify for COVID relief. Jeffrey Sachs, a good friend of mine, and Joseph Sticklitz, renowned Nobel Peace Prize economist, said we're not here because of a scarcity of resources but because of a scarcity of will. The lie greater than the so-called Trump lie is that we don't know what to do or that it's their fault. Every stat that I give you is a result of policy decisions. What, how do you preach in the bloody city? 700 people die every day from poverty and low wealth, according to the Mailman School of Public Policy. That's a quarter million people a year. What if a quarter million people in affluent communities just started dying? What if 700 college students just started dying? What would be the response? Eighty-seven million people in this country live without health care or are uninsured in America. They're either underinsured or uninsured. People who pray not to get sick because they can't afford treatment. One of them was a lady that was in the midst of, was part of the Poor People's Campaign, and when she hit, she was in the hospital. Finally, went to the hospital. She didn't have insurance. She went to the emergency room, Pamela Rush, and she sent me a word, Pastor, I'm going to die. Please don't let the Poor People's Campaign fail. Take care of my children.
how many times have we sent people from seminaries like Yale and Duke and other places, and these young folk go out with all intention and they preach and they stand over people and they preach the funeral of families. And the, mem the people whose funerals they are preaching should not even be dead. But we teach us, but we're taught well how to lie. And so we say God called them home. And God didn't have nothing to do with it. God may welcome them home, but they're dead because of policy murder. And um, some of us, a group of clergy, we've actually asked our, our, our membership that if someone dies because of poverty or the lack of health care, would they give us the permission to do what Man Emmett Till's mother did? Open the casket, call the media in, and say, we know God loves them. We know God will receive them. But this, what you're looking at right here, is the result of policy murder and not the result of somebody being called home to eternal rest. Are we exceptional? Sure. America's exceptional in some ways, but we're also exceptional in some bad ways. We're the only of the 25 wealthiest countries that does not offer some form of universal health care. And for every 500,000 people uninsured, 2,800 people die. Health care is connected to, in this country, our jobs and not our humanity. But the people who keep it that way get free health care from all of us. Every person elected to Congress, the Senate, or the House gets free health care, paid for by the people. And yet, there is so much effort to block it. In fact, the problem in health care exists because we've not fixed the problem that the social gospel movement identified hundreds of years ago, Walter Rausch and Bush, even Theodore Roosevelt, when he preached his 1912 Bull speech, he said that in the moral considerations of the nation, he said, a, a wage that allows you to live, health care and protecting the environment ought to be not political partisan issues. He had seven of them actually. 52 million people get up every morning and work hard and they make less than $15 minimum wage. I wish this zits and labor was not like this, but homelessness over the past 30 years, rents have gone up faster than income in every urban area in the country. By 2016, there was no state or county in the union, as I said, where folk could afford a basic two-bedroom apartment on, living, on a minimum wage. And as of 2017, every 100 extremely low-income renters, a mere 35 out of 100 will find affordable housing. The United States accounts for 4% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's incarcerated people. In fact, 95% of the growth in the incarcerated population over the past 20 years has been the increase in defendants who can't make bail. Not in defendants who are guilty, but defendants who can't make bail. And more than five million formerly incarcerated people who paid their debt to society also lost their right to vote. There are 12 million immigrant workers in this country, including five million undocumented people who were on the front line of the pandemic response. We didn't mind undocumented people being on the front line of this pandemic response. And isn't it amazing that we still call some people alien who, and we were the ones that took their land. In other words, they didn't cross the border, America crossed the border. That was one of the great fights of Abraham Lincoln when he challenged the so-called Mexican-American war. You do know Texas was Mexico, and so was California, <laughs> and New Mexico. Indigenous communities today are still living under treaties from the, war, from the, in, the, the in, indigenous wars. Still living under treaties. You ever been on federal land, Indian land, Native American land? Have you ever gone on that land and seen the houses and, and, and where they made people and the results of Andrew Jackson's Trail of Tears, Trump's idol, Andrew Jackson? 
And you know what the, the prettiest, most beautiful, well-built building is? The casino. And then in the midst of all this, since 2010, we've seen an assault on voting rights. 2013, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. And for nine years, what, this is what they did. They, they gutted the Voting Rights Act by saying that the formula needed to be adjusted because we really didn't have racism today. So they needed to adjust the formula. So they, didn't, they said, we're going to send it to Congress to fix the formula on what, what requires a state to be covered because the, the way a state was covered under the Voting Rights Act was based on their legacy of racism. And, and little, pe many people don't know, all a state had to do was stop being racist for 10 years and they would be no longer covered. That's all they had to do. Just don't pass any more racist voter suppression law for 10 years and don't blame all of that on Republicans either because I'm from North Carolina and we had to fight Democrats for years. All they had to do was just for 10 years. So they said send it to the Congress and the Congress has not fixed it. And I'm not talking about the Congress in recent Congress, I mean the Congress since 2013. This city is bloody. And, and, and voting rights is not a black issue. Voting rights, yes, voter suppression targets black people, but modern day voter suppression also targets women and students and the poor because ultimately voter suppression is about policy. How do we get power to dictate the $21 trillion gross domestic product? How do we get power? Recently, I was, I was at, the, um, at the Vatican meeting with economists and philosophers and theologians of different faith, and Pope Francis said, today we see that the world has never been so rich, and yet despite such abundance, poverty and inequality persist and grow. In these times of opulence, when it should be possible to put an end to poverty, the powers of one-track thinking say nothing of the poor, the elderly, the migrants, and the seriously ill, and how true he is, because listen to our political debates. When's the last time you've heard a presidential debate on poverty? Really, think about that. 140 million people poor and low wealth in the country, and you can run for the highest office in this country and never have to say what you're going to do to address the policy. 52% of all our children living in poverty. How are you preaching the midst of that, Ezekiel? Pope Francis went on to say neoliberalism simply re reproduces itself by resorting to the magic theories of spillover or trickle down without using the name. Trickle down becomes the only solution to societal problems. There is little appreciation for the fact that the alleged spillover does not resolve the inequality that gives rise to new forms of violence threatening the fabric of society. The real lie, I heard it the other day when I was in West Virginia, a politician running for office said, I'm running on the God agenda. The God agenda is God's guns being against gay military might and tax cuts. But it's not just that extreme. Take, take, for example, the recent in Inflation Reduction Act in Congress, the whole debate around that. I'm talking about this zits and labor. I'm going to get to Ezekiel and what he has to say, but this is the zits and labor we have to preach. And so you remember when the IRA was passed all over the news, everybody wanted us to applaud. Yeah, you know, the great, this is the most money we've ever put in the climate in the history of the country. Then that's sad. <laughs> And if you wanted to examine what wasn't in the bill, what had to be compromised, and you do know compromise is not a good word in this American reality. Every compromise I've ever read of 
compromise somebody's humanity, somebody's right. That's what got us in this mess in the first place, three-fifths compromise. I could go on down the line. You know, the 1964 Civil Rights Act was supposed to cover everything. It was supposed to cover uh, education and voting rights and wages, but then there was compromise which is why then they had to come back and try to do a 65 Voting Rights Act and then a 68 Fair Housing Act. The Democrats, for instance, had ambitious plans with IRA and, 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 and they, they wanted universal pre-kindergarten, they wanted lower child care costs, they wanted paid and family sick leave and enhanced child, child tax credit. But it was all cut out in negotiations and compromise. The bill disproportionately does, 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 the bill does not, when it was passed, there was a lot of great things in there. But when you said that, I remember, I know some people literally came at our movement for not just saying it was great. You know, we said all of this is great, but you still have to ask the question, what kind of society are we in when to get a little good, you got to cut out so much good? They cut out child nutrition provisions. The legislation first included $250 million for healthier school meals that, got, that was cut out. I won't go through all of it. We cut out living wages. Cut out. But the military budget went up. A military budget that is already at over $800 billion a year which if you cut it in half, we would still have more money in that budget than Iran, Iraq, China, North Korea, and Russia combined. And 54 cents of every discretionary dollar goes toward the military industrial complex. It doesn't go to the veterans, it doesn't go to folk with no legs and no arms and no eyes. It goes to the contractors. And one military contract with Boeing could provide full health care for every person in every state that has decided not to expand Medicaid. How do you preach? In this kind of zits and labor. I was there at the White House when they were celebrating the IRA and what was it Bob Dylan? Is he still alive? Bob Dylan? Is he alive? Did, I think he was, they brought him in to sing, didn't they, Cad? They brought him in to sing that day. And then, and then they complimented Manchin. Not one word of criticism. I, I was told it was political politics. Not one. He cut out things that affected 700,000 poor people in West Virginia. 350,000 People in West Virginia who make less than a living wage, one of my dear friends, Pam, who's a coal miner's daughter, called me while I was there. She rung my phone and said, Baba, what the hell is going on? Why are they complimenting him? Why not just don't say anything? She said, and then she started crying. She said, Reverend Baba, they act like the women in Appalachian, West Virginia, who every Tuesday sell tacos along the side of the road so they can build a community help fund for women that need supplies for their menstrual cycles but don't make enough money to afford it. They act like we don't exist. And the truth of the matter, one economist said, what we've had is a silent depression that has caught up with us was the University of Maryland political science. He said, what we're really beginning to experience is a process of slow decay punctuated by a reoccurring economic crisis, one in which reforms achieve sporadic gains, but the long-term trends of growing inequality, economic dislocation, failing democratic accountability, deepening poverty, ecological degradation, greater invasions of liberty, and growing imprisonment, especially of minorities, continues to slowly and quietly challenge the belief in the capacities and the moral integrity of the overall system and its governing elite. It's strange where the spirit is starting to speak out and, and, and challenge us. I was at MIT, and MIT is not known for theology. <laughs> and yet I was sitting in a class with Otto Swam. I was there in a special concert some years ago, a co cohort studying community economic development, and Otto Swammer comes in and says, 
to the class, there's a blind spot in American economic theory today. It's called consciousness. You, at MIT, that's what you're saying? If MIT professors are declaring that the problem of our society is consciousness, then what does that say about what seminaries better be doing? He says, the number one problem in our country, even in our world, is our refusal to have an economic theory that sees that we are all integrated and we really do need each other. And the truth of the matter, here's what I'm trying to point to this zits and labor, is while we have a democracy with great potential, and while we have a democracy that has done some great good, we cannot ignore that we have an impoverished democracy. And we are the Ezekiels being called in this moment. But in the midst of all of this, we also are seeing signs of possibility. That same Otto Swama was talking to another group of people and they talked about awareness-based collective action called ABC. And he says, when COVID hit within days and weeks, we, we as a species effectively changed our collective behavior because we could see what was going on. We saw the trucks lined up with, with the refrigerated trucks with bodies in it. We saw the lines. And somehow that awareness-based collect caused awareness-based collective action. We mobilized massive resources to fight the spread of the virus. They went on to say we can flatten the curve because we're able to bend the beam of collective attention back onto our own behavior. To bend the curve means to transform the rules that usually govern our collective behavior, which is the difference between natural science and social sciences. The laws of physics remain the same. If you focus your attention on bending a spoon, the spoon will not bend. But in social sciences, however, we have the power to bend the curve. We can change the invariances that govern our behavior by focusing our attention and awareness on them. In, the, in that case, metaphorically speaking, we can bend the spoon, and that's precisely what we are currently doing with this collectivity, collectively in fighting this environment. Now, I wouldn't say what he said that way as somebody interested in public theology and public public policy. What I would say is that awareness-based collective action is not new. It's a prophetic concept as old as the book of Ezekiel for how moral change and reconstruction comes. Prophetic theology seeks to turn people's ears into eyes and with new awareness they act but not only does awareness-based collective action have biblical precedent, it has historical and social precedent and markers. It's why many of us continue to say we need a third reconstruction rooted in, if you will, awareness-based collective action. And it's also why the, the problems I, and the facts I just laid out for you are so hidden, the powers and forces that control what we see and hear, because if people could ever see what 140 million poor and low wealth people look like, what 52% of the children look like, what 87 million with health care really looks like, it would force a kind of awareness-based collective action, which is why we have to have a third reconstruction, a reconstruction that's deeply rooted in our moral tradition, a, re a, a reconstruction that says we have to face five interlocking injustices at the same time, and we have to put a face on them. Systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, and the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. But before I go too far and press into how Ezekiel shows us how to do this, you do know what I mean by third reconstruction. If not, let me take one short moment. The first reconstruction took place in the shadow of slavery and amid the wreckage of the Civil War. African Americans joined hands with whites in the North and South who were willing to see them as allies along with deeply committed preachers and theologians, moral scholarship, and they set out to nurture what Abraham Lincoln had even called a new birth of freedom. Together, this fusion coalition elected new leaders, some of them African Americans, and many of them former slaves. They built coalitions in the South. They were, they were taught by Frederick Douglass, freedom is not enough. We did not fight just for freedom. We fight for full citizenship and the recognition of our full humanity. 
and the makers of the first reconstruction, they hammered out new state and national constitutions that created a national citizenship open to all people of all races. They built the first public school systems that many states had ever seen that not only helped black people, but helped all people. In fact, in North Carolina, they said that everybody had a constitutional right to public educate every person, not every child. This is in 1868. In 1868, when, when a black congregation, a white congregationist from Ohio and a black Methodist named J.W. Hood from Pennsylvania who had transplanted to North Carolina, when they were in the Constitutional Convention, they demanded that the preamble of North Carolina's Constitution post the Civil War sound like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor and the pursuit of happiness. Together, the first Reconstruction, they launched a brave experiment with a more expansive democracy, with a deep moral vision born out of scripture, born out of the example of the prophets and Jesus. Reconstruction was the struggle to rebuild and reinvent not only Southern society, but America itself. It was revolutionary and laudable, but it was also fought. Because see, in the first reconstruction, they saw racism and all the things that it causes as sin. But it was fought. It was fought by those who decided that a democracy with welcoming everybody was contrary to God's vision. It was fought by those who decided that they had to take back their country. And literally, if you read the language, read, read um, Black Reconstruction and W.B. Du Bois and other take back our country, make it great again. They were willing to be violent. They were willing to run a counter-revolution rooted in distorted religious nationalism. And they broke the back of the first reconstruction and then they had an election and somebody got elected who did not win the popular vote. And they held that election hostage until the person that got elected guaranteed that they would do everything they could, including reshape the Supreme Court. My friends, the zits and labor we're in now is not new. And they all claimed to re they were redeeming America. Second Reconstruction arose, black and white together and brown turned back to fusion politics in the 1950s and 60s. Born in the South, together they integrated public schools. They might have marched on Washington, and at that march on Washington, which was a result of movement, it wasn't to come in to hear one person named Martin Luther King speak. It was because there were 600 actions going on in 600 cities around the country and the agenda that day how many of you get so tired of going to MLK programs and uh, reverse and remembers of March on Washington and nobody talks about what the agenda was what the agenda was the agenda was a demand to end segregation fair wages economic justice voting rights education and the long overdue civil rights protection the southerners came together Black and white came together, but the Dixiecrats decided we can't have this. They launched another strategy. They murdered the leaders, black and white. They undercut the Reconstruction, and they vowed to take their country back. They vowed to make it great again. So the first two Reconstructions did not finish their work because they were destroyed. But it's even more reason why, Dean, we need a third reconstruction. And in many ways, if you all just give me a few minutes, the book of Ezekiel is a reconstruction text. And it's eight things. I won't go through all of them in detail. But Ezekiel teaches us eight things that we need, that we must have, that must come out of places like this. Number one, Ezekiel shows us that you have to take seriously the history of a stiff-necked people. God tells Ezekiel right up front, if you're going to preach to this nation, if you're going to preach to this bloody city, you have to understand that the people are stiff-necked. <laughs> In chapter 1, he goes right, right off the bat, he says, son of man, stand on your feet. He said, I'm sending you to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people whom I'm sending you to are obstinate and stubborn. This is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, I'm not sure. This is God saying, I'm not sure. 
for they are rebe- I'm not I'm God and I'm not sure but at least they will know there hath been a prophet among them huh? we have to have moral religious leaders who are willing to challenge a stiff necked society and who are not interested in quick wins but ensuring that the society can never say they did not hear an alternative vision, a prophetic vision. Prophetic voices are not guaranteed they will be heard. I hope we have a class on that. Preacher, there is no guarantee you're going to be heard. But preach anyhow. William Lord Garrison spoke out against slavery in the, in the, in the, in the 18th century and somebody told him he needed to be more moderate. And he said, when it comes to this stuff, I will never be moderate. He said, go tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Go tell, a, 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 tell him to rescue his wife uh, from the hands of a rapist with a moderate rescue. Tell a mother to gradually extricate her baby from a fire in a moderate way. But do not ask me to be moderate. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. I will be Secondly, secondly, Ezekiel teaches us that we have to understand how important it is to be called to lay among the people before you speak. Ezekiel chapter 4 said, Now, son of man, take a brick and place it before you, draw a picture of the city of Jerusalem on it, and then make a model of military siege against the brick. And then he said, get an iron skillet, place it up right between you and the city on the iron wall, face the model, the city shall be under siege, you shall be the besieger. He said, then lie on your left side and place the sin of the family of Israel on yourself. There is a need if we're going to have the kind of reconstruction that, 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 that this nation needs, this world needs, but this nation needs, is to have preachers and teachers and theologians who have the credibility of having been there with the people. Go lay among the people. Don't even talk, God says to Ezekiel, until you have experienced, until you have gone. That's why in this Poor People's Campaign Repairs, we've traveled from Appalachia to the Delta to New York to North Carolina to South Carolina to the Court of Shame to the San Francisco and the Tenderland, the Apache Lands, Arizona, Flint, Michigan, Miss Jackson, Mississippi. We've gone where Kansas farmers are committing suicide but making it look like the accidental death so that their families can at least get the life insurance to survive. We have to go among the people. And the number one thing that people say in all of these places is nobody visits us. Nobody comes to see about us. Nobody brings an incarnate reality among us. The Pew Foundation even said some years ago they did a study with, a, I don't know, with 50,000 or 500, that was a whole lot of sermons. They did a whole lot of sermons. And they wanted to hear, see, what was the American people hearing from the American pulpit? And when they examined all of those sermons, poverty didn't even register. And they said, and one of the questions was, can you even preach what you have not seen? Number three, we can't allow scapegoats Ezekiel says, to turn us away from the central problem. If we're going to have a reconstruction, you know, in Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50, Ezekiel says, the sin of your sister Sodom was this. She lived with her daughters in the lap of luxury, proud, gluttonous, and lazy, and she ignored the oppressed and the poor. Now, Christian nationalism has twisted the moral narrative to tell people the problem is gay folk. The problem is people lazy. The problem is, as, as Senator Tupperville said, people who want your stuff. The problem is trans people. But if we're going to have a reconstruction in America, somebody's going to have to say, no, it is as it always has been. Sodom and Gomorrah, you did not fall because of the distractions. It, it's really clear. You ignored the oppressed and you ignored the poor. All of us ought to take some time and read One Nation Under God, Kevin Cruz in his book, where he talks about the, the effort that was started in the 1930s to shut down the New Deal, to shut down progress. And he told uh, the great uh, um, um, manufacturers and, 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 and those uh, who don't have money in this country, give me some money. Told them at the Waldorf Astoria, 
and, and he was met with uh, the, the head of the national manufacturers, the head of the National Chamber of Commerce and oil companies, and I'll go out and buy pulpits all over this country because the only way we can shut down a progressive vision, we have to shut down the pulpit. We've got, and we've got to create a theology that's a distraction. And so for him, it was, he said, the theology that they decided to create was this strange form, false form of Calvinism that says if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. So if you're good, you're middle class or wealth. And if you're bad, you're poor. And so any attempt to alleviate poverty is a violation of the punishment of God. And you say, that don't make sense. Well, just because it don't make sense didn't mean a lot of people didn't buy into it. <laughs> And the whole network that exists today of religious nationalism is born out of that. And that was born out of what Frederick Douglass called slave religion. Not slave religion, but slave master religion. But Ezekiel says to us, if you're going to have reconstruction in a society, you can't be distracted on what the root of the real problem is. You can't be distracted. And let us be clear, as I'm ready to close, that Everything we see today was created for just to do just what it's doing. Donald Trump and those folks, <laughs> he didn't create this. I know that might bust somebody's bubble, and I know you just want to focus on one person, but I actually think we being too hard on the brother. <laughs> I think we're giving him too much credit. I think we're talking about him too much. I think we have made his lie too big. His lie is not the greatest lie. It was in the 1960s, after the Civil Rights Movement, that Kevin Phillips, Howard Dent, Pat Buchanan advised Richard Nixon. You can read about it in a book called um, A Time of Illusion. He said, we must create positive polarization. I got it there. We must create positive polarization. We must intentionally divide the country. We must pit people against one, one another. We must make people hate the advances of the civil rights movement, the advances of the women's movement, the advances of the peace movement, the advances of the gay movement. We must make that the issue. We must distract people. And then when it happens, we must deny it. Kevin Phillips said, all you got to do in American politics is work out who hates who and operate in the distractions. Hmm? Ezekiel knew that long time. Four, Ezekiel is told, he says, God says, Yo, his wife gets sick and he dies, and God says, okay, you get till 12 o'clock to bury her and cry. Then you got to go back to work. Ezekiel is trying to say to us something we must hear when the zits and labor is so bloody and so hurtful that there is a fierce urgency to some moments and that we must work on them constantly and without ceasing. That there comes a time we don't have time to be comfortable because those who are working on injustice and inequality, they are constantly at work. Then five, Ezekiel diagnoses the root of the epidemic, evil, and predatory politics in Ezekiel 22 when he says, your priests have violated my law. And they tell people things I have not said. Ezekiel says, look, you cannot ignore what happens when the religious cultus covers up evil. He says it is because the religious cultus is comforting those for preparating injustice that the politicians have become like wolves. That's what the text actually says. Like wolves devouring the people. Now I have to say this here. I'm from the South. And everybody knows that Southern plantation owners paid preachers and theologians to write biblical defenses in slavery. But we're not down South today. We are at the institution that Cotton Mather said you should be named Yale after he persuaded his friend Elihu Yale to make a major contribution to establish the school here in New Haven. But long before the Southern defenders of slavery, Cotton Mather taught that slavery was good for the enslaved and it gave them an opportunity to hear the gospel. We cannot, we, we, can, we, we must unpack that and what damage that caused down through the history of the country and how it enabled 
people to be wolf-like in their politics and feel as though they were operating according to God. Last two things. Ezekiel declared that change is not impossible. In the end of Ezekiel 22, he says, God says, look, all I need is somebody who will stand in the gap. Ezekiel remind we have to believe in times as, as ugly as the Zitz and Laban is that change is possible, that a third reconstruction is possible, that we are alive and it can happen. The seventh, God tells Ezekiel, he says, I, I couldn't find anybody. That's chapter 22. But 15 chapters later, God says, I know where to find the reconstruction. I know exactly how to change the nation, but I need you to do something. I need you to go down to the valley. I need you to go among the very people who are the victims of the predatory uh, uh, politics. I need you to go among the people who are bloody from all of the bad policy. And that's where you will find in the Message Bible that says, God grabbed me. And the spirit took him down among the bones and asked, can these bones live? And Ezekiel answered, right, I don't know. And God said, then preach. Preach among these bones because no matter how hurt people are, no matter how broken people are, they still have ears, spiritual ears. And that's your hope. Hear me today as I close. That's the hope. Being willing to go among the rejected, the dispossessed. They must lead the revival. We must work with them. Ezekiel says the way to a third reconstruction is not from the top down, but from the bottom up. The spirit is already rise, raising up an army in the valley of dry bones. Rihanna, I know you don't think I'd bring up Rihanna at Yale, but Rihanna said you got to find love in a hopeless place. Talk to me, somebody. And then the last line of Ezekiel, Forgive me for being too long. I'm through right here. The last line of Ezekiel is God is already present in the place where we need to be. The last line of Ezekiel says, and Yahweh is there. There where? Ezekiel describes this vision of equality. Everybody has the same amount of land. Everybody is protected. There's somewhere for everybody, even for the broken and dispossessed. And after he sees that, the, the Bible says, Yahweh Shama. God is there. In other words, wherever justice is, God is already there. Wherever hope is, God is already there. Wherever people are working for justice, God is already there. And when I was down in Jackson this week and I saw mothers crying to challenge that, I said, God is already there. Over when the seed people organizing in the poor people's camp home, family, God is already, God is always trying to get us where God already is. It's kind of like physics, Dean, and you can take this and I'll run on back to my seat. In physics, they said there's something called the Bernoulli principle. And they tell me that a modern sailboat can sail against the wind. A modern sailboat can sail against the prevailing wind. They say it goes upwind. Now, if you're sailing downwind, everybody knows that the wind pushes the boat. But if they have found out that it is possible to go upwind. If you set your sails right, then the headwinds will separate into two flows. One flow goes around the sail from the outside, the other goes inside, and the path of these two flows does not have to be the same length, but the two flows must arrive at the same time. And this means that the flow outside the sail must be faster than the flow inside the sail, but when that happens, it creates the Bernoulli principle. And what the Bernoulli principle does is the wind actually pulls the sailboat rather than pushes the sail boat. Sounds kind of Pentecostal to me. When you're pulled by the Spirit, sounds kind of Ezekiel to me. When you get pulled down into the valley of Jeroboam, that's why you, one of the main things we must do, even in places like seminaries, is we must teach people how to set their sails. If you set your sails right, with the right kind of exegesis. If you set your sails right with the right kind of ethics, if you set your sail right with the right kind of praise, if you set your sails right with the right kind of prayer life, then it is possible that the Holy Spirit can pull us where we need to be, where God already is. We used to sing a song down in North Carolina. It says, God is already here. 
God is already here. Can't you feel it? God is already here. All you got to do is just open up your heart and know God is already here. If you here feel like you're being pulled toward justice, that's God is already there. If you feel like you're being pulled toward righteousness, God is already there. If you're waking up at night and can't sleep and keep asking, what can I do with my preaching voice? What can I do with the church I pastor? What can I do with my scholarship? All that is is the Benelli principle in the Holy Spirit. God is trying to pull you where God already is. God already is where justice is. God already is where love is. God already is where righteousness is.